South Asia has the largest number of Muslims in the whole world, about a third of the entire total. Indeed, there are over a half a billion Muslims in the current nations of Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. This far exceeds the number of Muslims in the Arabian Peninsula, Egypt, and the rest of North Africa put together. Yet up to about a thousand years ago, there were very few Muslims in South Asia. Even after that, a relatively small number of Muslims ever immigrated in. Rather, the vast majority of Muslims living there today are the descendants of South Asians who converted to Islam. The history of the ways and the reasons that so many different Indian people decided to become Muslim can tell us much about the nature of Islam, the nature of various groups within Indian society, and the complex interactions among these. These patterns of conversion also help explain why India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh have divided into separate nations. In this lecture, we'll consider the several different historical ways by which so many South Asians became Muslim. In order to keep them clear, we'll divide these overlapping and complex patterns of conversion into three broad types. All three occurred over the same centuries, but each followed a somewhat different path and each concentrated in a particular region of South Asia. First, we'll look at the way that some coastal communities in India developed into substantial Muslim populations through interactions with intercontinental merchants, seamen, and saints, particularly those from the Arabian Peninsula. Next, we'll look at how Muslim holy men inspired large numbers of Indians to convert to Islam. This was part of a larger process in their community's economic and social change, particularly in the northwestern and the eastern quarters of the subcontinent. Finally, we'll begin to consider the ways that Muslim rulers and other warriors who entered South Asia established kingdoms and empires, at first in the north and then gradually across most of the subcontinent. This led to the conversion of many people, particularly those who dealt with those regimes. These three ways did not happen independently of each other. Instead, each affected the others to different degrees and in different ways. Islam had a different origin and ideology from any religion that started within India. But Muslims in India have mostly lived much like many other religious communities there. So let's first compare Islam with Hinduism, the religion of the majority of India's peoples. Over India's long history, various cultures and communities in each region cooperated and conflicted in complex ways to produce India's richly diverse religious traditions. In particular, Hinduism contains a wide range of beliefs and practices. Many Hindu families and individuals perform various kinds of religious duties, including occasional fasts and pilgrimages. But there's room for much variation in faith and practice within Hinduism and there is no single canon for all Hindus. As we have seen, across India there emerged a Brahmanic religious model of social organization, which organized people as Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, Shudras, in the Varna, or so-called caste system. But on the everyday level, and often more relevant, are the subgroupings of Jatis, or birth groups, each with its own traditional occupation and dining, marriage, and other traditions. There's no universally accepted way to convert to Hinduism, so almost all Hindus are born into that religious community. Further, we have also seen how various Hindu schools of theology perceive the universe in different ways, especially as monistic or dualistic. In addition, many Hindu people follow a bhakti pattern of personal devotion to a specific deity, this devotion might lead them to reject many of the ordinary social conventions. So overall, there is much variety in the religious and social practices among people called Hindus. In contrast, Orthodox Islamic theology asserts a single core creed. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his final prophet. The foundation of religious authority on earth for Muslims comes from the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. 
However, over the 14 centuries since the Prophet Muhammad founded the Muslim community, many different philosophical and religious schools of Islamic thought and law have developed. And Muslim communities around the world follow their own social customs. But key practices, often known as the five pillars of Islam, are supposed to be shared by all Muslims. Each pillar creates and regularly reinforces a strong sense of community. In addition to the Islamic creed, the other four pillars are, first, ritual prayer at set times during the day and always oriented to a cubicle building within Mecca, the Kaaba. This means that all practicing Muslims should be oriented in the same direction, doing the same prayers at the same time in their day. Another pillar is fasting during the daylight hours that all observant Muslims, except those who are pregnant, traveling, or ill, should respect during the lunar month of Ramadan. This means that all Muslims, rich or poor, should share the same feelings of hunger and thirst on an annual basis. The next pillar is the Hajj, or ritual-filled pilgrimage to Mecca during the appropriate holy month. All Muslims should perform the Hajj at least once if they're able to do so. This means that millions of Muslims from around the world come to Mecca at the same time, wearing the same pilgrim clothing, performing there the same rituals, and recognizing the unity of the Muslim community, despite the pilgrims' great diversity of languages, backgrounds, complexions, and local customs. This shared experience of the Hajj encompasses the entire Muslim community globally. Finally, there is the pillar of alms, in which the common wealth of the entire Muslim community is expressed. At the time of the Prophet Muhammad, a share of the wealth of rich Muslims was collected and then redistributed according to need. While many Muslims still individually practice alms annually, the formal government pooling and redistribution of wealth is not actually performed in very many countries. Still, many leading Muslim politicians have advocated Islamic socialism, arguing that the Muslim community has the natural affinity for collective ownership of property and the means of production. In practice, some people born to Muslim parents are not very religious themselves. So we should differentiate between Muslim people ethnically and Islam as a religion. Nevertheless, these centralizing Islamic beliefs and practices contrast strongly with the vast variety within many other religions in India and indeed around the world. The Muslim community which began in the Arabian Peninsula in the 7th century rapidly spread across much of Africa and Asia. Arabic remains the sacred language of the Quran, a formal prayer, and of many important Islamic texts. But Islam has proven persuasive around the world to people who continue to speak their own languages. Islam is still one of the fastest growing religions on the planet. Islam is open to converts. That is, anyone who submits to Allah thereby becomes a Muslim. All members of the Muslim community are equal before God, although many specific Muslim communities have struggled to actually practice this equality. Muslim converts tend to bring their pre-Islamic customs and values with them, which often assume social inequalities. This was certainly true of Islam when it came to South Asia. One important way that people in India came to become Muslims centers on the Indian Ocean trade. This trade has continued for over 2,000 years, ever since seamen and merchants recognized how the seasonal monsoon winds could aid them. Long before the Prophet Muhammad created the first Muslim community, Arabs, East Africans, and Indians had long been building wind-powered sailing ships that could ride the four-month-long southwest monsoon from Arabia and Africa to India, and then the equally long northeast monsoon from India back across the Indian Ocean. While these winds were predictable, they also required merchants and seamen to make only one round trip cycle per year. This meant long months in an Indian port waiting for the monsoon winds to reverse. Often, such extended visits meant that these seamen and merchants formed relationships with local Indian families. 
Some visitors married Indian women, had children with them, and established their own families in these ports. Some jatis and families among the local Indian coastal communities were relatively open to forming such relationships for, with these visitors. For example, in ports along the southwest coast of India, what is today the province of Kerala, some leading Hindu communities were matrilineal. That is, the mother held the family property, which her daughters inherited, along with much of the family's traditional domestic culture. Hence, in such Indian communities, a woman's children with a visiting man were strongly part of her family, although they were also identified with the father. After the 7th century founding of Islam, many of these visiting Arab merchants and seamen, whose ancestors had long been sailing to India, themselves converted to Islam. The status of such visitors as Muslims then influenced their friends and families in India. Similarly, when Muslim holy men called Sufis traveled to coastal India, they also sometimes married local women. The children of such Indian Muslim families carried on some of the traditions from each side of their ancestry. Some of these Indian Muslim communities became known as Mapila, literally son-in-law, since they derived their identities from outside men who joined the Indian family. For Mapilas and other Indian Muslim communities, several other of India's coastal regions had many formal public aspects of their practices and beliefs conforming to Arab Muslim patterns. For instance, their names and forms of prayer were often like those of their Arab Muslim ancestors. But many of their domestic beliefs and practices, largely influenced by their maternal traditions, remained similar in many ways to pre-Islamic Indian patterns. Therefore, different groups of Muslims in these Indian ports held different social ranks, depending on the status of their ancestors. Indeed, separate communities of Indian Muslims developed, which had jati, or caste-like characteristics, often with separate places of worship, and also distinct domestic marriage and inheritance patterns. Such Muslim communities came to be substantial proportions of society in several places along the Indian coast. In parts of Kerala, Mapilas form a majority of the population, but their outward links to and across the Indian Ocean meant that such communities themselves did not expand very far inland into India, although their influences did. Some of their own commercial contacts in the Indian interior were affected by these Islamic beliefs and leading to some scattered Muslim communities there as well. But the two other ways by which Indians became Muslims proved much more significant within India's interior. Let's turn to the second of our three broad ways by which Muslim communities emerged in South Asia, that is, through the actions and influences of Sufis. From early on in Islam, some Muslims sought direct experience of God. Such Sufi seekers sometimes found that the prescribed duties of prayer, fasting, pilgrimage, and alms sharing were not enough. Some even found such mundane duties to be distractions from their personal devotion to Allah. From among these devotees emerged especially powerful saints and other holy men, including a few holy women. Some of these leading Sufis gradually formed religious orders in which the charismatic founder inspired many and passed on his wisdom and spiritual power to chosen successors, sometimes a son, other times a leading disciple. Each Sufi order developed its own distinctive means of reaching a close personal relationship with God, including through song, dance, or other austerities. While some Sufi orders were closer to Orthodox Islam, other, more heterodox Sufi orders and individuals did not let conventional earthly religious duties limit them. Gradually, from the 11th century onward, Sufis began immigrating to spread their spiritual message in India. Eventually, such Sufi holy men extended their beliefs widely across India and settled down in many different regions. Often, they were themselves inspired by Indian bhakti ways of personal devotion to the divine. 
many South Asian individuals and communities responded to these Sufis by accepting their religious messages, which often reinforced their own spiritual traditions. Since some Sufis were so eclectic, some of their ways of reaching and expressing their love for the divine were amalgamations of Muslim and Hindu forms of worship. Some Sufi holy men denied that there was any true distinction between Allah and Hindu deities. For example, the 15th century North Indian mystic and poet Kabir rejected the worldly requirements of both Islam and Hinduism, singing to his followers. In a poem later translated by the Nobel Prize winning Rabindranath Tagore, Kabir identifies with God and proclaims, Where dost thou seek me? Lo, I am beside thee. I am neither in temple nor in mosque. Neither am I in rites and ceremonies. If thou art a true seeker, thou shalt see at once me. In addition to the religious messages of Sufis, some of them and their disciples also carried with them more practical expertise that would enable their local Indian supporters to prosper. Such Sufi influences were especially pivotal for socioeconomic changes in the Indian communities living in the northwestern and in the eastern regions of India. In both regions, Sufis gradually enabled their followers to become settled farmers and thrive, even as they converted to Islam. In the northwest, the upper Indus region known as the Punjab, the land tended to be arid and unable to support settled agriculture through rainfall alone. So many people were herders whose grazing animals require less surface water. Sufis who came from Iran and Central Asia were familiar with irrigation practices that had been developed in those lands. These included the Persian water wheel, where a series of buckets driven by a gearing system and powered by draft animals could raise a large volume of underground water to the surface. With the construction of such new irrigation methods, herders in the western Punjab in particular could settle as farmers, often clustering around a Sufi hospice or shrine. This agricultural development increased their production and thus their prosperity and population at the same time that many of these communities converted to Islam. Some of their leaders married their daughters to the Sufi or his sons, thereby strengthening the bonds between them and raising the social rank of the bride givers. Since many of these communities converted together and since they followed Sufi holy men who tended to be eclectic in their spirituality, these converts and their descendants carried with them many of their pre-Islamic customs and beliefs. In the western part of Punjab, which is now the largest and most populous province in Pakistan, many Sufi shrines are still centers of devotion with pilgrimages and festivals celebrating the spiritual accomplishments of their original founders. The spiritual power of these deceased Sufi saints are believed to be able to cure economic problems and spiritual, emotional, and physical illnesses for their devotees. However, some more orthodox Muslims consider these popular traditions and even worship of Sufi saints to be diversions from true Islamic theology. Over in the eastern region of Bengal, much of the land was still heavily forested. So many Adivasi people living there followed Sweden or shifting agriculture. After Sufis and their followers arrived, these local communities learned to master the metal technology of steel axes and plowshares that enabled them to cut down and root up large trees. For thousands of years, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Padma River networks had eroded silt from the Himalayan mountains and from North India and deposited it as Bengal's rich deltaic soil. So once cleared of forests, these lands could be very richly productive. The people of this region also learned methods of intensive wet rice agriculture. You'll recall that rice is one of the most productive of crops, often three times more productive than dry grain crops like wheat. But rice plants need a constant and carefully controlled supply of water. Too rapid a flow and the rice washes away or drowns 
but a period with no water can stunt or kill a crop. Therefore, people have to be taught how to level the soil, channel and direct the water flow, plant and transplant the seedlings, and then harvest the mature rice crop at the optimal time. With the knowledge brought by Sufis and their followers, many Bengalis, particularly in the eastern part of that region, cleared the trees, settled, and prospered as wet rice farmers. Their communities grew more numerous and simultaneously converted to Islam. As in the Punjab, many of these converts carried with them their pre-Islamic ideas and followed eclectic combinations of Hindu and Muslim customs and beliefs. Further, since the eastern part of Bengal had not yet been incorporated into the Brahmanic Hindu social order, the Adivasi and other communities living there were largely classless. The relatively few Muslim elites who emerged from these communities were people who mostly claimed distinguishing ancestry from Sufis and from other prestigious Muslim immigrants from Arabia. Overall, however, the Muslim community in eastern Bengal tended to be more egalitarian than in some other regions of India. They eventually formed the new nation of Bangladesh. This leads us to the third broad way that South Asians became Muslims, that is, through the influences and effects of Muslim rulers who invaded and established kingdoms in several Indian regions. Even from the earliest days, the Muslim community in Arabia sought to defend itself and also expand by force as well as by persuasion and conversion. After a series of military campaigns, by 711, an Arab general, Muhammad Ibn al-Qasim, finally captured Sindh, the region around the mouth of the Indus River. This was less than a century after the emergence of Islam. Sindh has remained under Muslim rulers virtually ever since. Sindh now forms the second most populous province in Pakistan. Sindh's main port of Karachi is Pakistan's largest city and its economic powerhouse. A few hundred years later, Muslim rulers based in Afghanistan or Central Asia began to invade India by land from the northwest. Sometimes these were brief forays, but India was such a rich land that some Muslim rulers made repeated incursions. In particular, Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni in today's Afghanistan conducted a series of 17 raids between 998 and 1030. Even today, Sultan Mahmud remains a model for many militant Muslims. For example, Pakistan has a ballistic missile named after him, the Ghaznavi. While such raiders often use the rhetoric of Islam to encourage their soldiers, their motivations were often far more political, mercenary, and military rather than religious. Such raiders did not establish their rule very far into India. More influentially, starting in 1206 and lasting for 300 years, a series of five Muslim dynasties made Delhi their capital. Expanding out from Delhi, they conquered much of North and Central India. These dynasties are collectively known as the Delhi Sultans. Most of these rulers originally came from Afghanistan and Central Asia. But these regimes tended to be very fragile with their governors and military commanders breaking off to form independent kingdoms of their own, especially in the central Indian Deccan and the eastern region of Bengal. Thus, while some of the most expansive of these Delhi sultans, like the early 14th century Muhammad bin Tughluq, managed to briefly conquer most of India, none of these five dynasties ever succeeded in creating a stable or long-lasting empire. In contrast, the Muslim Mughal dynasty from Central Asia eventually defeated the last of the Delhi Sultans and gradually established itself as one of the world's wealthiest, most powerful, and most extensive empires. We'll discuss the Delhi Sultans and the Mughal emperors later in our lectures. But it's important to note here that none of these Sultans or the Mughal emperors could have survived and expanded without the support of many Indian people. Some Muslim rulers rewarded those of their employees and subjects who became Muslims. Indeed, a substantial number of the Indian warriors, officials, artists, and workers who served these Muslim rulers converted to Islam out of conviction or practicality. 
Many of the families, clans, and communities who became Muslim also carried with them much of their pre-Islamic culture, including their social status and especially their family traditions and customs. Indeed, some hereditary landholding clans in North India and the Deccan came to include both Muslims and Hindus simultaneously. They evidently decided that those of their members who interacted with the Muslim rulers should become Muslims. But others of the same landholding clans remained Hindu, particularly those who dealt with their Hindu tenants and employees. As described in a mid-19th century ethnographic account by a touring British official, Colonel Sleeman, in his Journey Through the Kingdom of Aud, Hindu and Muslim members of a Rajput clan lived together, though of different creeds, in, quote, tolerable harmony. The clan members dined in the same room, but there was a chalk line symbolically separating those who are of Hindu from those who were Muslim. They married only within their own religious community. The Muslims had Muslim names and the Hindus had Hindu names, but both still went by the same common Rajput Jati or clan name. The eldest male was the head of the clan, regardless of whether he was Hindu or Muslim. In such instances, many social customs were shared by them all, so the religious identity of the clan as a whole was ambiguous. One of the issues faced by all Muslim rulers in India was the legal status of the vast majority of their subjects who remained non-Muslim. Within Islamic doctrine, some non-Muslim communities can hold the status as zimi, protected subjects. Often in exchange for the status, these non-Muslims must pay a special tax called jizya. But to qualify for this protected subject status, many Muslim legal scholar, scholars and theologians claim that Allah must have chosen a prophet from that community to receive the Quran. Indeed, the Quran itself specifically mentions earlier prophets, including Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Thereafter, these chosen people, even if they did not become Muslims themselves, could hold protected subject status. Women of those communities could legally marry Muslim men, for example. But there's no evidence in the Quran that Hindus were ever chosen by Allah to have a prophet. Consequently, some rigorously orthodox Muslim scholars assert that Hindus cannot legally be protected subjects. Yet since Hindus form the massive majority of people under virtually all the Muslim rulers in India, most of these rulers allowed them protected subject status anyway. So more orthodox Muslim rulers made their Hindu subjects pay jizya. But other Muslim rulers, especially starting with the Mughal Emperor Akbar, abolished jizya and largely respected the beliefs and practices of his Hindu subjects and his Hindu wives. By surveying these three broad ways that various communities in South Asia converted to Islam, we can begin to see why they eventually formed three different nations. In 1947, the large concentrations of Muslims in the Northwest and in the East became West and East Pakistan. But the cultural and historical differences between these two wings of Pakistan, separated by a thousand miles, contributed to their breaking apart in 1971. East Pakistan seceded and became the independent Republic of Bangladesh, the land of Bengal. What had been West Pakistan became all of Pakistan, with Punjab and Sindh as its two largest provinces, collectively constituting about three quarters of the entire national population. Within the constitutionally secular Republic of India, about 14% of the population is Muslim, making them the largest minority community in that nation. But these Muslim communities are diverse and geographically spread across India, with one of the largest concentrations in Kerala, where we saw the Mapulas emerge, and another in the heartland of the Delhi Sultanate and Mughal Empire. In this lecture, we have seen some of the broad ways that Islam came to India and how and why so many Indians converted to it. The Muslim dynasties that conquered and ruled much of India from the 13th through the early 19th centuries interacted with their Hindu, Muslim, and other subjects in ways that created new political and religious ideas. 
we'll look more closely at those dynasties and their non-Muslim allies and rivals in the next few lectures.